This is Golf with Jay Delsing. A two-time All-American at UCLA. A participant in nearly 700 PGA Tour events. Seven professional wins to his credit. Over 30 years of professional golf experience. A member of the St. Louis Sports Hall of Fame. This is Golf with Jay Delsing. Golf with Jay Delsing on a Sunday morning on 101 ESPN. We're presented by Darty Business Solutions. We're coming to you from the Car Shield Studios. I'm Dan McLaughlin. That's Jay Delsing. Another Sunday upon us, partner, and away we go. I love it, Danny. Can't wait. We got a great show, and uh, it's always fun to be with you. And we got lots to unpack this week. Jim Tejans, the author of Saves, the title of his autobiography, incredible story, two heart transplants, loves the game of golf, and also has a history of sports here in St. Louis, primarily soccer. He'll be our guest coming up next segment in studio. And we have the UHY prep profile, and I know you really enjoy doing that, visiting with some of the young golfers in the area. We got some great young studs coming up, lots of uh, good golf being played here in St. Louis. And, you know, the boys play in the spring, and it's a tough, tough time. But uh, I know they're all excited to play, and I can't wait to see how it all plays out. And, your oldest, Luke McLaughlin, will be oh, right boy. in the mix, man. I know he will be. He's uh, one of the top players, and uh, look forward to watching and see how he does. Well, here we are in February. Sometimes you get good weather. Sometimes you get bad weather. But I can tell you this, the boys, as you mentioned, playing in the spring, I just don't like that. I wish high school rules would change and allow them to compete like the girls do in the fall because you still get the back end of summer and some pretty good days to play. Oh, 100%. The golf courses are in are much better condition, Danny. And I can just remember <clears throat> back in the day, it, it kind of seemed like the, the winters were colder back then. But we'd hit, we'd hit a shot, and sometimes the ball would plug and go straight into the bottom of the earth, you know, and you'd have to get a, a tee and a, and a wedge to help get it out of the green. And the next hole, you'd hit it, and the ball would bounce, land right in the middle of the green and bounce 30 feet in the air because the green was frozen. So snow came and went. It gets wet here in St. Louis because yep. it melts. Yep. Explain to the golfer how you play it then when it plugs, as you mentioned, it can plug. It plugs yep. in a fairway. Yep. How do you play it? Yeah, so th- you th- there is a, um, a rule that through the green, anywhere, through the green, um, that's not true. When your ball, with the exception of the penalty areas now, if your ball plugs in the penalty area, you do not get a drop. But anywhere else in the rough, if the ball breaks the surface of the ground, in the fairway, on the green, on the on the fringe, anything, you get to lift it. You got to mark your ball, pick it up, lift it, clean it, and then you um, you got to drop it as close as, to that spot as you possibly can. So there's a lot of go, a lot of a lot of it's it's a, it's hysterical. I think you and I talk about this anytime whether, whether we're pulling up to play a muni somewhere or some cool place like Ambrier or Whitmore or Norwood or Bell Reeve whatever and we always I'll I'll just tap you on the shoulders we're driving by and I'm like that guy's breaking the rules. That guy's breaking the rules. <laughs> She's not dropping. You know cuz the rules of golf are just funky and, and you, it makes you wonder like um do they know or are they just taking advantage you know there's we all have that kind of cynical side to be like well they, they might know they just don't want to drop over there but um yeah so it's just a tough time of year most guys are playing lift clean in place right now through through the green which which is you know everywhere even the bunkers aren't maintained yeah. quite you know Steve, we're, we're likely to get another snow before, you know, we get the break out the shorts and the sunscreen. I can't wait. I'm I, ready. If you're I a mean, golfer, you're saying, man, I've been on my couch too long this winter, this off season, not to pick up a club, not to play. Isn't it awesome when I can remember being a little kid and getting to watch the West Coast swing and watching Hawaii, watching Pebble Beach, and then watching Riviera and the L.A. Open. And I always thought... I wonder if I could ever do that, you know, and then I got to do it and it was, oh man, it's just, it's, it's still a thrill. And I, why do we live here in the wintertime? <laughs> I mean, I, I know we both love St. Louis, but dang, man, this, are the winters getting longer? They're, as you get older, they get longer and you get frustrated. There's no doubt about that. It does get frustrating. Um, you mentioned the West Coast Swing. 
the first two months have kind of lacked a little juice on the PGA Tour with what, you know, the West Coast swing. It just, I don't know if it's Liv and some of the bigger players aren't involved, but it just lacked a little juice to start off. So, Danny, I was going over to the Dean team the other day and and having my car serviced, and the, the, the staff over there is just so great. And I was talking to Anthony in the service department, and he said to me, he goes, can I talk to you for a minute? I said, sure, what's up? And he goes, I love the game. I'm going to play it every time I can. I'm, But he goes, I'm not watching it anymore. I don't know who's who, who's gone where. John Rahm's over there. I don't know how to find Liv. I'm, I don't like Liv. Um, I don't get to watch Patrick Reed. I don't get to watch Bryson DeChambeau. DJ's over there. Now I turn on the PGA Tour, and they're trying to work out a deal with the Saudis. I'm pissed. I'm not watching. And I said, Anthony, I don't blame you, man. Keep playing the game. Keep loving it. If you don't watch, it sucks. But I, I don't I don't know what to say to them, Danny. This is a, a guy about my age who's always loved the game and supported the game and talked. You know, I go in and drop my car off, and he's like, did you see that shot? And, right. You know, what a drive or something like that. And he's frustrated and, and really kind of just fed up. Now that you've watched Liv, what would you take away from what they're doing and implement that into the PGA Tour? Nothing other than maybe the team thing. I mean, I do like the idea that they're trying to loosen up a little bit. You know, if we can draw some of the younger people into the game, that would be fantastic, right? But do we have to have a rock concert to do it? I mean, you know how much I like music. You bought me that... that, um, Speaker, uh, the, the, but I was trying to think of Bushnell, the, that Bushnell wingman, yep. and it is the best, folks. Bushnell wingman, if you want to listen to music, <laughs> we need also, them as a sponsor. It'll, it'll, yeah, and it'll also work as a uh, your GPS and your rangefinder out there. But anyway, and I love it. But I mean, we don't have to have it playing at a fifteen, you know, because not everybody enjoys that. So I mean. I like the team concept. I think that thing could eventually have legs, but it needs to be developed way more so than what Liv has done now. And everything that Liv has done, Danny, to me, and I'm not a fan, I'll just be honest, is, but they, I'd call, I'd, I'd tell you what I liked about them. If they had more sense of organization and a better sense of a business plan and a business model, I'd probably sign off on a few more things. But right now, I hate the small fields. I hate the no-cut. I hate the fact that it's a shotgun start. I don't mind the shorts, but I do think from a business standpoint, we just look better in longs. I would rather wear shorts. But I'm saying, if someone said to me, I'll, I'll I'll get involved if if you guys wore long pants. You know what I mean? Sure. I, I, maybe that's a stupid thing to say, and maybe it would never happen. But it's that's that's kind of the way I see it. I mean, I think shorts are great all the way up the practice round. Wear them in the uh, in the pro ams and stuff. But you know, I, I don't think that's necessary. But the team concept, if it's done right, you you could you could have some fun with it. But it's a it's a haul. What I wonder, and I want to ask you about this. We've seen the NFL and the AFL. We've seen the ABA and the NBA. And, and you know what, Danny, there were growing pains for all this lousy stuff, and here's this and that, the WHA and the NHL, and now they're all together. They've, they've managed through growing pains and years and years to, to come together. Is that what's going to happen here? I think it has to. I think for the betterment of the game, it has to. When you have your top players and guys that move the needle playing it with live. In the PGA Tour is rolling out, again, very good players, but no one knows them. There has to be a coming together. Now, what does that look like? I don't know. But there has to be a merger. World golf rankings have to be figured out. The live setup needs to be changed with cuts. I think that's important. Um, but I do see it coming together at some point because all parties involved are going to realize for the betterment of the game. Now, the money is there. Don't get me wrong. It comes down to money. But for the betterment of the game, They need to come together because ultimately fans are going to tune this thing out. And if you don't have fans, you don't have income. You don't have, you don't have the interest. And they're the ones that make the, the, the purses what they are because they're watching, they're attending all those things. That's the thing that, that frightens me wrong word, but I can't think of a better one, but the most is that when has 
that been brought up? We're talking about ridiculous amounts of money that our fans can't, I can't even fathom. We were talking about, you know, $3 billion just gets interjected into the PGA Tour. We don't know any of the terms, how much they have to pay back, when they have to pay back, what's the interest rate, all that, all that other stuff. But it's just, it's gotten so money driven, Danny. It's like, when, it, when, when are fans going to go, I'm out? Yeah. I am one that will watch live. I don't, I don't understand some of the graphics that they have during the, the rounds. I understand who's leading the tournament. I don't understand, though, the team concept and things are flying. I, let me take that back. I understand the team concept. I know, I but, know, I know what you're saying. But you, watching it, I'm confused a little bit. Right. And I, I think if you're beyond the casual fan, which I am, and if I'm confused, then I can understand the casual fan has no idea what's going on. And that's no fault of their own. It's just it's hard to follow. Well, let me let me ask you this, D. I thought that Liv did a really smart thing by bringing that tournament to Vegas. And it turns out, nothing. I mean, there were nothing. The ratings were awful. I mean, there was uh, th- reruns of, like, the Three Stooges were getting better. <laughs> you think I, I'm kidding. I know. They were getting better numbers than live in Vegas. And uh, that's – I just – I was shocked at that. I thought in Vegas you get a little bump, maybe you bring in some fans to watch – and it, it didn't happen at well, all. Well, because the Super Bowl, though, Dave, to your but point. But that's why know, you do it, though. You I know. Go on, put, take some of your best guys, put them on Radio Row, and promote your league. That didn't even happen once. No. How did they? See, that's what I mean. There's just, there, there's, I know Greg Norman fashions himself as the smartest guy in the room. But he needs some people around him to, to start, you know, propping this thing up and start making some better decisions. I mean, and why wouldn't you when you have the access to so much money? I mean, you could buy more organization, buy more structure, buy more, you know, have some foresight here. What does the plan looks like? Look like how much money are you going to donate to charities? Who are those charities? Let's, I mean, let's start talking about things that, that, are similar to the PGA Tour so that when we try to put these things together, it's going to make some sense. But right now it's like Liv is just almost like trying to hang on until there's a merger, and now we get this other money from the Fenway Group, and it's like Tiger says, we don't need the money. Right. Uh, Greg Norman, by the way, this last week was asked about the World Golf Rankings, and he said, quote, they're laughable. You know, he makes a point when you have the top players in the world and they're not getting world golf rankings, it's very hard to decipher who's top 10, who's top 20, who's top 30, so on and so forth. In a way, he's right. But, Danny, you can't just start a league and expect 48 guys to start earning points that are similar to what the DP World Tour is doing, the Japanese Tour, and then the PGA Tour. I mean, you've got to – that's where they lacked – the, the 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 wisdom or like hey guys we're gonna start this league what do we need to do that's the question that should have been asked here's here's what we're thinking and they're like yeah this isn't gonna fly man this is I personally don't think this is anything to do with live if anybody else starts a 48 man field somewhere and says hey man we're gonna pay Rory to be there we're gonna pay, and they want to get some, you're not getting world ranking points no. out of that you're just especially not, no cut Right, D, and think about this. The second half of a 48-man field, you and I are way more than a casual fans. I can't name three of those guys. I can't Still, either. This is year three. And I mean... Man, that's hard to believe. It's already year three, Isn't huh? that something? Now, look, D, we could go We could go. John Rahm, DJ, DeChambeau, Philly Mick, uh, Joaquin Neiman, uh, Bryson DeChambeau, Patrick Reed, we could go knock off the top 10 to 15, no trouble. But after that, I mean, having, you know, Jose Ortiz over there and, and Abraham Answer, I mean, really good players. But, but Danny, they're beating nobodies right. on the back end of the field. And, then, and by the same token, they're not beating those other fellows we just mentioned. It's like they're the middle class. It's six players. And they're going to be stuck in the middle class. The player I miss the most, and I think he's looked at as a villain now in golf. Well, Mickelson would probably be the one I miss the most, whether or not he was competitive on the PGA Tour. He still looked as a villain, and you're right. I miss him, too. I miss all those guys. 
Yep. I miss Kepka. Yep. I think he's kind of a villain too. Yep. Yep. I do too. I got to tell you what though, D, D I, I miss DJ. Yes. I missed it. Patrick Reed was always great for this show, man. He broke more rules in three years than, you know, <laughs> a guy would in an entire career. And I want to tell you, and I know I'm in the minority on this, but I love Bryson DeChambeau. I love the fact that this is a dude that has just decided, hey, man, this is how I want to do this. It fits my brain. I don't care what's happened before. I'm going to do this. And, I mean, the guys won what? Uh, one major in five or six PGA Tour events. And sure. Just broke molds with the way that he tried to do it. And he comes across as this, you know, no one likes him. When Whenever I had him, when we were working for Fox, Danny, he'd come up to me, take his little Ben Hogan hat off, Mr. Delsing, Bryson DeChambeau, I heard you're going to be with us today. If there's any anything you need from me to... That's great. I, I like, love hearing that. Right. Super respectful. Just a, just a good kid, you know? And so... I, 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 it hurts my heart to have golf so blown up and so fractured. It, it's just fractured and it's, and it's, it's broken. I mean, it's broken for lack of a better word. And it, it's, it sucks. And I don't, I don't see a solution anytime soon. Golf with Jay Delsing is off and running. We're going to visit with Tim G, uh, Jim Tejans a little later in the show. He's actually standing just outside our studio. Let's tip our cap, and we're going to tip our cap to the start of the boys' high school golf season. Our, our tip of the cap is brought to you by the Dean Team Volkswagen of Kirkwood and our buddy Colin Burnt at 314-966-0303. Dean Team Volkswagen of Kirkwood can get you any vehicle, guys. I'm driving a, a Yukon. My daughter's driving a Passat. It's it's a it's a great place. They'll they'll help you out. Yep, we are literally weeks away from the start of the boys' high school season, and I can't wait to watch. We've got Luke McLaughlin, your oldest son. We've got Bubba Chapman. He's a senior at Chaminade. We got two studs down at St. Louis U High, uh, Harrison Ziffel, and we've got Nicholas Laella. I always it's a tough word, it's a man. Tough, tough name. name. I said to him last. I said to him last week when I was talking to him, man. I hope I don't screw your name up in there. I just <laughs> it did. And then we've got um, a young man over at CBC. Harper is a a really good young player. And also, every year we get a new you know a new load of kids that are coming in. So I'm really looking forward to to seeing how it shakes down. We've got. We've got uh, Chaminade is a good team. We've got Slew is a good team. We've got Priory is a good team. Now, they're not all in the same classes because of the sizes of the school, but lots of good golf, lots to root for. So keep your eyes focused on the boys' uh, high school golf. We will follow it. We'll give updates, and hopefully we'll get the, the eventual champion on the show. And that's the tip of the cap, and it's brought to you by Dean Team Volkswagen of Kirkwood. That's also a preview of the UHY prep series. Okay, Jim Tejans is coming up. He's written a book. It's called Saves, the title of his autobiography. He has had two heart transplants. He was a goalie at SLU. He'll talk about what he went through to get to this point. Really an inspiration for a lot of people. I'm looking forward to this, Jay. Um, we always get different walks of life on the show, and this certainly is somebody different, not necessarily golf-related, but... Like you had Adam Wainwright last yep. week. So we try to get different sports figures on, and he had a, a very accomplished uh, soccer career here in St. Louis, but his story truly is amazing. Yeah, absolutely. And, I mean, to, to I've, I've been knowing the name Jim Tejans. He was a goalkeeper and a South uh, County kid and uh, and professional soccer player, played with my brother-in-law. And, and, and then to understand what he's gone through and his family, I mean, he, he's, he's kind of a, a – a badass warrior, man. Um, I know he's going to have a great attitude, so it's going to really be fun to chat with him. All right, Jim Tejans is coming up off and running. This is Golf with Jay Delsing. Are you driving an out-of-warranty car? It's only a matter of time before your out-of-warranty vehicle is in the shop costing you thousands of dollars. Auto repair costs are up nearly 20% from last year, which is four times the rate of inflation. If an unexpected breakdown happened today, would you be ready for that? Well, now you can be with a plan through CarShield. Even if your car is just over three years old, it's still prone to expensive costs. Your car is more than just getting you from point A to point B. 
traveling by car is a way of life. From picking up your kids to going to a new restaurant, cars are a daily essential. When you enroll in a car protection plan through CarShield, you can look forward to the following. The price will never go up no matter how many claims you file or no matter how high the mileage on your car increases. CarShield offers protection plans that start as low as $100 per month. That's $100 per month. They have repair coverage for up to 5,000 different parts of your vehicle. Plus, when your car breaks down and you're stuck on the side of the road, you get 24-7 coast-to-coast roadside assistance. You also get complimentary towing and rental car options. CarShield has my back when my car breaks down, and they can have yours too. Call CarShield today at 800 465 6550 or visit carshield.com. It's CarShield, proud sponsor of the Golf with Jay Delsing Show. Get ready to watch the legends of golf up close when they compete at historic Norwood Hills Country Club right here in St. Louis. The Ascension Charity Classic will be back again with some of golf's greatest names Steve Stricker, Padraig Harrington, John Daly, David Duvall, Bernard Longer. Justin Leonard, David Toms, and more will compete returning September 3rd through the 8th. Visit ascensioncharityclassic.com for information. Darty Business Solutions has been enhancing the business of our customers for the last 37 years. How do we do it? Through our expertise in technology, better use of data and analytics, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. We roll up our sleeves and collaborate. We build applications and effectively communicate with our partner clients to bring their goals and objectives to the finish line. Our award-winning Access Point program is a community game changer. With nearly 100 students in the program, mostly young African-American females are making between $55,000 and $60,000 per year right out of high school. That's right, fifty-five to sixty thousand dollars a year, right after high school graduation. That's when they begin their training. CEO Ron Darty believes the talent is equally distributed, but access to that opportunity is not. So here is Access Point providing more and more opportunity for those in and around our community. It's Darty Business Solutions. Hi, this is Peter Jacobson, and you're listening to Golf with Jay Delsing. I'm delighted to welcome the Amateur Players Tour to the Golf with Jay Delsing show. The APT team has worked so hard to establish a national golf tour for amateurs. Folks, don't miss out on this opportunity. If you love golf and ever wondered what all the fuss about tournament golf is, then this tour is for you. We just released the 2024 schedule and it is a beast. There's 21 events currently in the metropolitan st louis area with many more to come but check out these golf courses paynes valley ozark national stone wolf ambrier persimmon woods gateway national and a 36 hole event on norwood's west course and many more okay so the courses are certainly cool and nice but what's really neat is the way the events are run and how they are run the apt team does a fantastic job of closely monitoring handicaps and ensuring a good and fair competition. There are five divisions, a year-long points competition, major championships, elevated events, and much, much more. Right now, there are over 6,000 members in 41 different local chapters across the country. And all that's happened in just over five years. Join now and don't miss out on the best tournament golf in the country. Run four amateurs by amateurs themselves. Go to amateurplayerstour.com. That's amateurplayerstour.com. Golf with Jay Delsing on a Sunday morning. That's Jay Delsing. I'm Dan McLaughlin. And we welcome in studio Jim Tegens, author of the new book, Saves, the title of his autobiography. And Jim, anybody that hears your name knows your background in soccer. But uh, thanks for coming in. We appreciate it. No, it's a pleasure to be with you guys this morning. Let's start with the book. Uh, How did it all come about? 
Well, I would say about eight years ago, I met a guy at the gym by the name of Jeff Kuchno. Um, this was a gym down south. I live in Oakville. And we had become friends over the years because we'd see guys, each other at the gym every week or really every day, every other day. So kind of became friends. I always knew that um, he was in journalism. He was a communications teacher at Oakville. But years ago, you remember the North County and South County journals? Sure. Oh, sure. I mean, they would have 20 pages sports. Well, I guess he was the sports editor, director, whatever you call the North County Journal. And I remember, you remember all the ads and how big a deal that was? So he was heavily involved in that. And he, you know, when we became friends, he learned about my story over the years. And probably about three years ago, he asked me if I would want to write a book. And I've said I'd always was interested in writing a book, but I really didn't know where to start. He's like, I can be that guy. And I said, let's do it. So that's kind of how it all started. Give us an idea of your health, though. And that's why you wrote the book, at least primarily. Right. So I wanted there to be sort of a record of my story, mainly, I think, for my kids and my family. So people know of a lot of my story over the years, but they really don't know. They think they know it all. But when they get into the book that they see that it's much more than they ever thought. So what is that story health wise? So the story starts I mean, honestly, the story starts when I was 21 months old. My father passed away from a hereditary heart ailment at that time, just called myocarditis. But what that turned out to be in modern day terms is idiopathic cardiomyopathy, which is a generic term for sick heart. And they really don't know what causes it, but it's what happens is your heart swells over the years. And once it starts swelling, it's like a muscle. It just goes sort of haywire and it can't, it can't beat. Right. So my father, I lost it. His age was 32. I was 21 months old. So then I had a sister who was in the Navy, Karen. She passed away at the same age, 32. So it was at that time that I sort of knew that there's a good chance this is going to happen to me. Now, I was playing professional soccer at the time down in Fort Lauderdale when my, well, actually, you know, my sister had already passed. But anyway, at that time, I started preparing that mentally this is going to happen. So start preparing for it. As time went on, medicine was changing. The medications were changing. I had confidence that if it came to this, I could probably overcome this. So certainly probably the age of 30, I started going downhill and it was the heart issue. I was diagnosed. I was diagnosed on a Halloween, um, the day after Halloween, at uh, what was St. Anthony's. The week, uh, the weekend before, I was at this, uh, in Herman, walking up the steps of the Stonehill Winery. I was 29, 30 at the time. I kept having to grab the rail and rest on the top, or rest every 10 feet so I knew something wasn't right. Got home, went to the hospital, started going through the testing. Long story short, I had the same thing. And at that time, the doctor categorized it as, hey, Jim, you got a bad pump? We're just going to get you a new pump. So sent me down to the folks at Barnes and, um, you know, kind of hung with them, got on the heart transplant list. Actually, remember getting on the heart transplant list on my birthday, which is February 25th. And that July, which would have been of 1992, July 2nd, 1992, I received my first heart transplant. So wow. a lot of transplants happen on holiday weekend. Um, so that was my weekend. Yeah. So, well, so Jim, you, you, Man, how, where do where do we begin with that? I know that you pl- you actually played in the NASL with my brother in law Tim Twelman. Um, he was with the Minnesota Kicks, right? And 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 then did you play more soccer? I, I just want to kind of give the yeah. the background of how you're at, at a young age. You're having this these heart issues, but. I mean, 29 is not too old to be playing in the NASL, the no, MASL, all, right. the indoor league, whatever. Right. Well, I stopped playing in 1984. Um, and the Fort Lauderdale team had moved to Minnesota. I played a season with the Fort Lauderdale Sun in the USL. We won the championship that year in Fort Lauderdale. And I just kind of decided at that point it was time to get back to St. Louis and, you know, try to really – start, try to start a career. I'd only had two years of college in me by that time. 
uh, went back at Webster, um, started working at Rawlings Sporting Goods, yep. which you'll learn about Finest in the book. In the field, it, was, man. it was an amazing job and uh, did a lot of great things, a lot of fun things. You you hung out with Mark McGuire quite well, a bit. Well, I, I don't want to say I, I hung out, but uh, I would say that I became pretty close um, with his agent. They trusted me. Mark trusted me. And basically, it wasn't my role at Rawlings, but the agent told the president of Rawlings, hey, Howard, I want Tejans to manage the relationship between McGuire and Rawlings. And I did. Um, and it, it, was a, it was a great run. It was the year he hit 70 home runs. And we came up with some unbelievable ideas. I don't know if you guys remember, but we did commemorative bats. And these commemorative bats sold for a lot of money. They were very valuable and uh, um, were very profitable for Mark and Rawlings. So I was quite in the thick of that, and it was a good time. You know, Danny, time. Dad, my dad, put, and Jim, my dad played for right. 10 years in the bigs, and he was always Rawlings, finest in the field. I remember that was always a thing around our house. That's right. Even though when my dad finished, we'd use that finest in the field for second base out there. You know, we, <laughs> yeah. that's, how, that's how bad we glove. were up in North in North County. Cold yeah. glove, hard of the hide. Yeah. You know, I worked a lot with um, Ozzie Smith and his glove. He used uh, what was called – uh, a trapeze glove, and it's got a lot of lacing into it. And, you know, you guys have been here as long as I have. I mean, we would see how quick Ozzy would transfer the ball from his Nobody glove quicker. to his hand. And part of that was because his glove was stiff. He wanted a stiff glove. So you would continuously relace his glove to make it firm and stiff because part of his field motion was more of a guide of the ball to the hand as opposed to a catch the ball, go in with the hand and get it out. It was just his quick motion that I've never seen. I saw him practice it often and never seen anything like it. But it, it was great to kind of – I'm a baseball guy, you know, 64, 67. You know, saw Bob Gibson strike out 17 Detroit Tigers when I was eight years old. Never forget. I, I don't know about you guys, but – I'll never forget that day. No. You know, never Jim, forget that day. Jim Tejans is our guest. The book is Saves, the title of his autobiography. We really wanted to get you on the, the show because you're an inspiration for people. How many heart transplants? And it, you've gone through a lot physically. Yeah, so so I've had um, – you know, let me just start off by saying that from the very beginning, I knew once I had my first heart transplant – it was going to be a life of complication. And I was 32 at, the, at that time. But I made a decision right there and then that I was never going to look at myself as a patient. And I never did. I mean, there was sort of a lot of support groups and things like that. And I sort of chose to stay away from them because, you know, a lot of those guys were older than me. And those would be discussions that, I didn't really want to be a part of because a lot of those would go to a different way. A lot of people would get transplants in those days because maybe, maybe they didn't, you know, I don't want to come across the wrong way, but maybe they had issues because they didn't take care of themselves. I was a whole different story. I was a young guy. If healthy, I could have been in the prime of my career. So I looked at it as like, I'm not in their category. I'm going to take a different approach. Um, so I never, ever, and I still have it, looked at myself as a patient. So that was the number one thing that I did. And then I always believed in the doctors, not only the doctors, but the whole medical staff. And I would start building my recovery plan before I was ready to recover. I'm like, if they can get me to here, once I get to here, I'm going to take it from there and get me all the way. Um, and again, I could do that because I was 32 and I was still pretty fit. Um, and I just, uh, they'll joke that the doctors will joke and say, Jim doesn't listen to us very often. And it's true because I've got my own sort of plan and I take it and run with it. And it's don't worked. worry. It's we, you know, you, you sometimes you got to take phone calls. You're okay. okay. We're, hey, we're, 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 that's, we're, that's, we're good. We have all my sorts. next press person calling. <laughs> yeah. Right. But, when but, when but do we any, get you on? Yeah. Yeah. But so, so that's, that's sort of been my, uh, my MO and it's worked for me. 
And I'll share something real quick with you. After the first year, I decided to go to the Transplant Olympics. They were the World Transplant Olympics, and they were in Vancouver, Washington. So I thought, hey, I'm an athlete. I can do this. It was a year out from my first transplant. I'm in decent shape. Um, so I go up there, and I'm going to participate in the 100, the 220, and I'm going to You play. were a goalkeeper, and, man. You and, didn't run that well, much, did you? I, I know, but I had good hand-eye coordination, <laughs> and they didn't have goalkeeping back in there. Yeah, that. right. So, so I sign up for the track and field, and in the first heat, it's 200, 220 or something. I get down in my, in my squat to take off, and I look to my left, and I look to my right. These guys got track spikes on. <laughs> I, you got, got tennis shoes. I got new New Balance tennis <laughs> shoes on. I'm like, whoa, this isn't going to be good. They absolutely smoked me. Uh, I was in one heat where out of four people, I turned number two. And my mom's coming across. Two. He got two. And I'm like, mom, there's only four people in the yeah. heat. <laughs> it's still inspirational, Jim. So, so you get your first heart transplant in 1992. How long does it last? And, and give us some of the ideas. I've actually had a friend whose wife needed a double lung transplant and was unable to get it, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And so when you're on these lists, you really don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, so I felt all along and was very confident that Barnes Hospital. I mean, I just always had a positive attitude that this is going to happen. Um, I'm 32 years old. They're going to find a match. Um, you know, they're trying to find a match for you that suits your body. On my first transplant, they did. It was a 16 year old um, young man, young boy who was killed in a motorcycle accident. And my heart came from Tennessee. I mean, it's very important. You know, they're matching the right organ with the right person. So I, you know, I was on the verge of death. Um, my ejection fraction was about 11%, which the normal range is 55 to 65. And the doctor said that when they took the heart out of my body, it literally in the, in the surgeon's hands, it literally just fell apart like mush. Um, but I waited essentially from February 25th to July 2nd. And the main issue with um, the cardiomyopathy for our family is it created these heartbeats called VTAC, VTAC, and it stands for ventricular tachycardia. And those are the kind of beats that can kill you instantly. So that's what they're most concerned about, that your heart gets into this rhythm and it can kill you instantly. You know, remember um, Reggie Lewis and Hank Gathers? That's what killed those guys, mm. ventricular tachycardia, which was, you know, sudden cardiac death. So I was constantly in and out of the hospital during the waiting time because they didn't want to chance me being at home with VTAC happening and then, you know, me passing away. Jim Tejans is our guest, author of Saves. We'll take a quick time out. It's the title of his autobiography, and this is Golf with Jay Delson. you remember the golden rule? I'm sure you do, but just in case it goes like this. Treat people the way that you'd like to be treated. At People's National Bank, that one statement is the cornerstone of what this bank is all about. Locally owned with 23 locations in Southern Illinois and the metropolitan St. Louis area, People's National Bank parlays a robust menu of commercial or personal banking services you could possibly need with a friendly yet hardworking Midwestern attitude. Maybe you just want to do business with a bank whose entire team lives in the same neighborhoods as we do. If you're like me and doing business with someone you trust is important to you, then People's National Bank is the bank for you. Jason Rantham, local president, is here for you to call and he'll answer any questions you may have. His personal cell is 314-974-2243. You can also find us online at peoplesnationalbank.com. People's National Bank is here for all of your banking needs. Hi, this is Adam Best from Family Golf and Learning Center. At FGLC here in Kirkwood, we feature a double-decker driving range, two large grass tees with Tahoma Bermuda grass. You want to work on your short game? We have a short game area, too, which features a 20,000-square-foot green, three bunkers, and zoysia surrounds. Also at Family Golf and Learning Center, don't forget about our nine-hole par-three course. 
the indoor TrackMan simulators, and our performance center. If you're looking for the best golf instruction, regardless of skill, we can help. Find out more at FamilyGolfOnline.com. That's FamilyGolfOnline.com. Family Golf and Learning Center. We make St. Louis better at golf. If you're in the market for a newer used vehicle, any maker model, then you need to visit the Dean Team Volkswagen of Kirkwood. They are the official vehicle provider of the Golf with Jay Delsing show. My daughter and I both drive vehicles supplied by Colin and the Dean Team Volkswagen of Kirkwood. And it's because we know we can trust them. They made the car buying experience painless and easy. And their customer service is second to none. Every single step of the car buying experience was taken care of for us. You can reach Colin at 314-966-0303 and he will answer all of your questions and put your mind at ease. The Dean Team Volkswagen of Kirkwood has new or pre-owned vehicles to be purchased or leased, whichever you prefer. Once you visit the Dean Team Volkswagen on Manchester in Kirkwood, you'll be a customer for life because they will treat you like family. The Dean Team Volkswagen of Kirkwood, the official vehicle provider of the Golf with Jay Delsing show. Hey, St. Louis, Eddie McVeigh here from Maggie O'Brien's. When you head downtown for a concert or cards or blues game, and now for the St. Louis City soccer game, please come see us at Maggie O'Brien's before and after your event. Take our shuttle to and from or stay in-house and watch your favorite team on our multiple high-def TVs. We look forward to seeing you soon at one of our two locations in Sunset Hills on South Lindbergh or downtown at the corner of Market and 20th Street. Union Station is next to us. So you've been hearing me talk about one of our community's greatest contributors and most philanthropically inclined companies. Yes, of course, I'm talking about Marcone. They're the largest distributor of General Electric appliance parts in North America. Did you know that Marcone is also the largest and most trusted supplier of commercial and residential appliance parts, HVAC, plumbing, commercial kitchens, and pools and spas? All of that's in North America as well. That's right, Marcone does all that. Marcone is committed to supporting our first responders, all the branches of service in our military, our police and firefighters, and many more. From the viewing deck at the Ascension Charity Classic, founded in honor of our military heroes, to their commitment to Reese Across America program, Marcone is here for you and your family, as well as your community. That's Marcone, the official sponsor of the Golf with Jay Delsing Show. Jay Delsing on a Sunday morning, our guest Jim Tejans, author of Saves, the title of his autobiography. We were talking during the break. It's not just one transplant, you've had two. And we wanted to get you on to talk about your story. It's inspirational and maybe just give people an idea how to check their heart, things of that nature. But what's it like to go through two of these? I don't I don't know if I know anybody that's done that twice in their lives. Yeah, you know, I, I've gotten used to it. So <laughs> I went into the second heart transplant with incredible confidence. Um, and it just challenges in my life, medical challenges in my life have just been a part of who I am. And, you know, I just try not to get rattled. Um, after my first heart transplant back in 92, three days after the surgery, um, one of the surgeons walked into the room he brought a stationary bike and he said, get on this bike. You know, you have a young, healthy heart, get on this bike. And I was kind of like wide eyed, like, what are you kidding me? You know, something's going to pop in there and blood's going to start squirting all over <laughs> the place. And I was scared to death, but he said, get on the bike. I got on the bike. And from that point, I just never looked back. Um, and just that simple act of him bringing the bike in gave me the confidence that I need. So when you get a transplant and you're going from, it's like that you've ran out of gas in your car, it's empty, boom, you turn it, nothing happens, right? You put a new heart in your body, it's instant, right? You had this huge surgery and it's sore, but you have instant energy. And it, I mean, honestly, I would lay in my bed at night at the hospital, I'd turn around and I'd look at the, look at the monitor, the EKG, and to see a normal sinus rhythm, 
it would, I would literally cry because I hadn't seen anything like that in months. And I knew there was a chance at any time I could die. And there was one time at Barnes before the first heart where all the bells and whistles were going up. I heard all the feet. I was at the end of the hall, the last room. I hear it like bulls coming down the hall, running to my room. And I had that episode of VTAC. And at that point, you know, it's one of the code, Cody, I was coding, I guess. Doctors are all coming in the room. People are beating on my heart. And I was engaged at the time to be married. And at that time, when these guys come in, anyone's coming in the room, anyone on the floor, and they're just doing anything they can to kind of do this and pop your heart back in. So that scared me that I thought I was going to die at that moment and um, didn't. That was a good thing. They started me asking me questions about getting a hold of my fiance and, you know, scared me a lot. Start giving me medicine, which I was blacking out, which I thought I was dying, but I guess it was more the medication. But, but it, it's very scary, but that was probably the scariest episode I had. But over time, what happens, you and your heart become one. So when you first get transplanted, you know, there's sort of like a dating or getting to know each other period. But as each year passes, you know, you get to that fifth year, the funny feelings have gone. It's like you and the heart become one. And you've got to learn to expect all the funny feelings throughout those years and understand you learn your body so good yeah. that you know it better than the doctors. And I would always be, okay, take a deep breath, Jim. It's okay. Don't, if you get a feeling you're, you haven't had yeah. before, don't panic. It usually works itself out. But you need to know that point in time when it's time to call the doctors. So, and I became very good at that, very tuned to my body. So, Jim, the first heart lasts you 25 years or so. What happened? And wh- and then in 2018, you wind up with a, a new heart and a... Yeah, uh, great, great question. So what happens over time is transplanted hearts, when they cut the nerves, something having to do with the nerves, but generally speaking, transplanted hearts are going to develop coronary artery disease, not because anything that I've done, but it's just the nature of a transplanted heart. So back in those days, they would say, hey, you know, we think you can get 10 to 15 years out of the heart. Now, that was back in 90, 1992, and we're, to, we're in 2024 now. So what happened was two things. I started to get coronary artery disease, not horrible, but starting to slow me down. Maybe my heart was going from 55% ejection fraction, which is low normal, to a 40. So slowing down a little bit. But more importantly at that time, the medication you take for your heart, it starts to damage your kidneys. So at that time, people weren't living you know, 25, 26, 30 years on a heart transplant. But you're also not a 32-year-old. Your average age is not 32 when you're getting a new heart. It's probably 52. R- right. Or, yeah, that's or, a good you, point. You know Other I mean? than people that have had it from, but you're, you're yeah. exactly, yeah, you're exactly right. So over time, the kidneys were damaged by the immune suppressed drug for the, for the heart. So, you know, you're sort of like, you know, you're, because you're lasting so long, you know, it wasn't expected. Your kidneys two are going to problems. Be, yeah, two problems. So the heart wasn't in horrible shape when it was time to get it. I was on kidney dialysis for three years. Oh, yeah. um, and I continued to work at that time, um, work from home. Kidney dialysis would be three times a week and, you know, work online and that type of thing because the wait for a kidney is generally three to five years. So when they found a kidney for me, the rule of thought is if you're going to need a heart transplant in three to five years, they'd rather do the heart and the kidney from the same person. Well, I was fortunate enough to get an offer on a kidney and a heart at the same time. And this was a young man. He was a combat medic in Missouri National Guard, combat medic. He, this guy was a picture of health. He was 23 years old, Cape Girardeau. Um, the combat medics motto is we serve so others can live. We serve Mm. so others can live. How appropriate for you. Even in this young man's passing, he was serving. He gave me life. I mean, it's just, I remember that that time there were two drownings in St. Louis 
It was uh, it was August, August 12th, so not exactly a holiday. You guys might remember, but the drownings were in Castlewood Park. There were two females. There's a section in Merrimack that's really bad there. I, I thought for sure that was it. Well, I come to find out it was not it. And I had sent his mother, I had sent the mother, um, you go through the right channels, Mid-America Transplant, send them a, a note. And in March of the following year, I got a, a letter back. And I knew immediately when I saw the letter, I didn't recognize it. I knew what it was. So I was in my room and I was backing up and I backed up and I sat on the bed and I opened the letter. As soon as I opened the letter, it was a card and a letter, a picture fell out on the floor and it was face up. Army fatigues, picture of health, pr- probably about um, five eight. not a big guy, but fit. And I started, I, I had to chuckle because I thought, I said, and, and I thought it was all me. Mm-hmm. I'm like, what were you thinking? You know, and I looked down and see this. It's just amazing. So it all, it all came together. Do you yeah. feel like an inspiration for people? I mean, I feel really that, I mean, honestly, what saves is about, there's so many people here that I would not be here. And it's not just medical people. It's friends, it's family, it's total strangers. You know, it's a, um, it's a carpenter came into the room at the hospital when I was closed off because I had some bad infection and he was working on a part of my room and he saw how sad I was. And he, I told him I would give anything for a chocolate malt and he brought one. It's someone cleaning the room. It's, it's so many people. I like to refer to it as the chain of life. You know, when this young man took his own life, you know, he's in Cape Girardeau. There's paramedics that are called to the scene. There's a lot of action that has to take place immediately if it's going to lead to a transplant. They got to keep him alive. There's so many people that have to touch it before it gets to St. Louis and the surgeon. And if one link in that chain fails or is broken, it doesn't work. So I am trying to live my life sort of in honor, salute to all those people that have allowed me to be here. I mean, I was able to reach my dream, which was be married and be a father. I have two kids. and Tell I Tell us have a story a, about your daughter who's now, because of all the things, yeah. she's, is now an, a, a nurse. Yeah, my daughter is a, uh, real quick, my two kids, the first, two, first people in the Tejans family with a family of seven that tested negative to the bad heart gene. Wow. So... My daughter played volleyball at FSU, and she had to have extensive testing. And I didn't know what the results were going to be. I was scared as hell, right? She tested negative. She was the first person out of seven people to test negative. I mean, you guys tell me. Uh, Is that a miracle? It it is to me. I mean, I'm a Catholic. That's a miracle to me. Then my my son gets tested. Am I going to get two out of two negative? No way. He's negative. It's great. He's That's got amazing. a daughter. I have a gra- uh, nine-year-old granddaughter. She doesn't even have to be tested. In my Tejan's family, it's gone. It's gone forever. You know, I, I, I'm the luckiest. I, I mean, how could I have ever been angry at God? He gave me two kids. He gave me a granddaughter. You know what? I got a bonus. They don't have the bad heart gene. So it's kind of like, bring it on. I'll take it. Bring it on. Um, yeah. But then... I, I missed your question, or was it yours? Oh, just no, a, no, inspiration we just, and then asking about your kids. Your, yeah, and your yeah. daughter's a nurse, and I yeah, know that she's yeah, been in so, the hospital. You know, I, I mean, I, I'll brag a little bit about my daughter because um, she's an overachiever. And, you know, in my in my eyes, she's a, she's a little shit. I don't know if we can say that. <laughs> but, you know, she is a fluke, went down to play FSU with the big girls, and she held her own as a setter. And, and she's always overachieved. So she made her own decision to become a nurse. She took a long route because she played, you know, college volleyball. And she's not brilliant by her nature, but she outworked everyone. And she finished number one in her class. And she's developed so much 
common sense and I've seen her interact with the doctors and I'm so, so proud of her. Um, I had a surgery in October and a surgery in November. Um, we could talk a little bit about it, but I've got some serious issues on blood flow below my waist to get to my feet. And it's called peripheral artery disease, PAD, peripheral artery disease. So it's something you guys may not have heard of, but it's an epidemic in the world. A third of the people in the world have it, but it's not a marketed disease. It doesn't have a big name like leukemia, lymphoma, lymphoma, American cancer. So there's not a lot of funds going towards it. So I have had 15 leg surgeries on, in the last 30 months. And it's all to open up blood flow to the legs because if you have no blood flow, essentially your nerves are going to die. And I've had multiple wounds down here. And if you have no blood flow in your toes, the wounds won't heal. So it's no relation to your heart issues or right now. That's the issue. They don't know what causes it. I believe what's going to happen is they're going to find out that it's going to be multiple things that cause it. You know, it could be, you could be someone who just your lower extremity veins and arteries age quicker. Um, you see it in a lot of labors or on their feet a lot. Um, it could be from chemotherapy, from diabetes. They haven't really pinpointed it, and that's why they haven't solved it. But, but what I believe they're going to find, and it's not going to be solved in my lifetime, uh, but I believe they're going to find multiple causes of it. But what happens is the docs go in, and they try to open those arteries. And when you get down past your knee, there's three arteries from the knee down to the feet, and they're thin. So it's not like your big, thaw, big thick you know, hard arteries. So you can put stents in from your waist to your knee, but down there it's really hard because they're so thin. So they'll try to open them up. They may stay open for a week, a month, six months. You don't know. So that's why I've had the 15 surgeries. Do you get a lot of people that call you about this stuff and they're in the same predicament and ask for advice? You know, I don't get a lot of people that call me related to the PAD but I talk to a lot of people about it and people have so little knowledge of it. They don't even know what it is. So I'll talk to them. I said, well, here, here's what I recommend you do. I recommend you go to a vascular surgeon and there's pretty simple tests. They could tell what your pressures are to tell what kind of blood flow you have from your knee. So I'll talk to them about that type of thing. As we wrap it up, where can people find the book? Uh, the book right now is on Amazon. There is a hardback. There's a softback. Uh, the hardback is sixteen ninety nine on Amazon. The um, sorry, the softback sixteen ninety nine. Hardback twenty six ninety nine. I was born and raised in Oakville. Oakville Deerbergs is carrying it in their lobby display <laughs> That's right pretty now. Pretty awesome. We have our own website www.inspireme one word inspiremestories dot com. Thanks for coming in. We appreciate it. And best of health to you. Yeah, yeah, thank keep you going, for having Jim. Me. Keep going. Yeah, good to talk to you guys. Jim Tejans, author of Saves, the title of his autobiography. We'll continue with Golf with Jay Delsing on 101 ESPN in a moment. Powers Insurance and Risk Management is a family-owned local business that's been helping our community for over 200 years. In the always confusing world of insurance, Powers Insurance provides clarity, exceptional service, and the latest and cutting-edge products to deliver the highest quality in property and casualty coverage, as well as strategic planning consultation services. Powers Insurance and Risk Management will partner with you. That's right, they'll partner with you to customize the right coverage for you and your family. Tim Davis, Chief Operating Officer, will personally sit down and talk you through the ins and the outs of your policies. They are experts at helping you control your workplace expenses, helping to guarantee the safety that you and your employees need. You can visit them at powersinsurance.com. That's powersinsurance.com for all your insurance needs. WXOS, WXOS HD1 East St. Louis, 101 ESPN is driven by Auto Centers Nissan, home of the lifetime warranty and 30-day return. Hey, Jay Delsing here, and I know I speak for all of we golfers. We're always looking to improve our games. And for me, that means I go to one place, and that place is Pro-Am Golf in Brentwood. 
Tom DeGrant opened his family business in 1975 with a goal of providing St. Louis with the finest in golf equipment, instruction, and technology. Whether you need a new range finder, your first set of clubs, or anything else you can think of, Pro-Am Golf has just what you're looking for. If you're a scratch handicapper or carry a 20 handicap, come visit Pro-Am Golf and inquire about a lesson from Tom DeGrant. He's been fixing golf swings and making St. Louisans better at golf for over 40 years. Get your gear, your lessons, anything else golf-related where I go. That's Pro-Am Golf in Brentwood. You can also visit them at ProAmUSA.com. That's Pro-Am Golf. This is Chris Nagel. And you're listening to Golf with Jay Delsing. Golf with Jay Delsing continues this Sunday morning, and Jim Tejans was our guest, again, author of the book Saves. It's the title of his autobiography. That's Jay Delsing. I'm Dan McLaughlin. Uh, really an inspirational story. He's been through so much. Your heart goes out to him. Your heart goes out to anybody dealing with the type of conditions he's dealt with. Man, Danny, I feel like he could tell us more and more, and, and as he was talking about the things that have happened to him. I was, I was kind of like, what am I complaining about? Right. Man? You know, I look at you, I'm like deep, my left leg, my knee, my shoulder. And here's a guy that's had, you know, he's on his third heart. I mean, the original and then two and, and a couple other transplants. What did he say? He had 15 surgeries from on his, I, I yeah, just a great attitude. You could tell. And he uh, keeps himself in, in great shape and a real inspiration, man. I mean, just keep going. Okay. I want to get into the masters. Augusta National put out their scorecard this past week. Yep. Only noticeable difference was adding 10 yards to the second hole. They pushed the tees back a little bit. What do you think about that? So, D, what, what's more important than that to me as a player is, I don't know if you caught it, but he said they moved the tee The back. alignment. They, they moved it back to the left, so that means yep. they're making that hole more of a dog leg. So what that means, because a lot of times – because Augusta is very generous off, off almost all the tees, you're able to hit almost any sort of tee shot you want. And the preferred tee shot by 99% of the tour players is a fade with their driver. That is a fade. You're going to get up on number two and try to hit a fade now? Good luck. Yeah. Good luck. So, so you're going to have to stand up there for the guys like Patrick Reed that, that love to hit that little hook. For guys like... You know, DJ's a hits that hard fade, but you know, for anybody that's won at Augusta and won a major, can work it both ways. But you got to have you got to hit a good drive there now to get it right down that right side and, and take advantage of that slope and to to knock it on that thing in two. And a lot will depend. Hopefully, do you, we get some decent weather for Augusta. I feel yeah. like the last three or four years, it's just been nasty, cold and rainy, and just not great. And we're, what, about a month and a half out yep, from yep, Augusta. Yep. What can they do, Jay, and you've been on those grounds, hallowed grounds. I love it. I, I kiss. The I masters. got on my hands and knees the first time I went down there, Danny, and I kissed the ground because I was like, I've never seen this vast. It just was so perfect. The color is like not a blade of grass, no trash, not a cigarette butt on the ground. So Augusta National with what they have, the amount of land that they have, are they landlocked or is there something that they could do with the course to add, to subtract, to make it tougher? I know you don't want to change things because that's the great part of this, but what can you do? Is it landlocked or is there something they could do to make this even, I guess tiger proof is the best way to put it, but yep. all these guys are bombing it. Right. Well, Tiger proof, and, and now you've got the the next generation after Tiger that are making. That's what I mean. Yeah, yeah of course. So yeah, the the answer is yes and yes. So they are a bit landlocked, but when you have as much money and influence as the membership at Augusta National does, for example, D, the 13th tee, last year they added 25 yards onto it. How did they do it? They bought the 12th hole at Augusta Country Club. No, not the 12th hole, the 9th hole at Augusta Country Club in back of them. Wow. They bought a hole. I mean, 
you know, think about, well, well, forget it. But but that's that's the kind of thing that they do. There's, for anyone who has not been to Augusta, this was an old um, uh, nursery where they, they, they grew. It, it, it's just absolutely stunningly beautiful. The grounds are, there's a lot of a room around it. Some of it they own, Danny. Some of it they don't own, but they there's ample places for parking and things like that. But when you start thinking about dramatic changes, I don't think they're ever going to need to do that. And the one reason is, D, the greens at Augusta are the differentiator, not the tee to green. Okay, now, is it important to control your golf ball from tee to green so that you're not on the wrong side of the hole, you're not on the wrong side? Absolutely, you will not win the championship if you don't. But the greens are where the thing gets insane. I've had players say to me, you know, if it wasn't the Masters, I'd never play there. Really? Why? Because the greens get that crazy. Really? They can get that hard, that fast, and so slopey, Danny, where you'll see a guy hit a shot to that front leftish hole location on number nine and have just a tiny bit too much spin on it and he'll have a 55 yard shot left sure because it'll roll back down the face and the the false front and things like that so so but that that's just a couple of players that have said that that is not the pre- predominant sentiment it's a awesome tradition what I really feel like they've done well is they've made changes as the games changed without altering the overall product too, too much. You know what I mean? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And I think they've really done a good job of that. They There's some traditions in Augusta, we talk about this every year, that, that's, that's really cool. Like the the like you and I go there and get a, a sandwich and an ice cream. and a, I mean, I've taken groups there, Danny, 15 people where they're getting cheeseburgers and beer and popcorn and Snickers, all of this stuff, and it costs, 45 bucks. I love that. It's 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 amazing. You get a sandwich for a dollar 12 and a beer is like a dollar 89. So they they've frozen all of the um all the prices there um at I think 1972 or 1973 levels. Why is the uh, pimento cheese, cheese yeah. sandwich why or the pimento yeah. cheese? Yeah. Sandwich, yeah. Why is that uh, related with Augusta? What's the? Do you it's know a the story? southern. It's a southern. I don't know, uh-huh. that, but it's a southern. What I what I've been told is it's a southern thing, and pimento cheese is a. I don't even know how it got together, but the, you've had one, I assume. They're pretty damn good, <laughs> and and you know what else is great is the egg salad sandwiches, Danny. Straight white bread. Just like the bunny bread you and I grew up on, you know, making yeah. making those sandwiches when we were kids, and it's, you know, it's a, it's like a dollar twelve or something like that, and and you could eat, yeah, a lot of them, a lot of them. I mean, they've got pulled pork sandwiches in there, and you know what's interesting, D, is all of this stuff, with the exception of the candy. So there's a Snickers bar, there's some M and M's and things like that. And those are all Mars products, confectionery goods. Augusta makes all this stuff themselves. Oh, that's now, cool. I didn't know that. The beer is a light beer or a regular beer. It's not a Bud Light. It's not a Miller Light. It's not a Coors. It's a light beer, and it's a regular beer. The sandwiches all come in Augusta National Wrap. The ice cream, Augusta National Wrap. The only thing that I noticed wasn't were the candy bars that are, you know, and the, and the M&Ms. But everything else is, it's, it's all... Um, um, private labeled, and Augusta does it all themselves. So we're talking about the Masters in this segment, and we'll get to our UHY prep profile in just a moment. But how does the course rebound that you know to the way that, like you said, no blade of grass is out of place? You got thousands of people running all over it during that time, and then you come back the next year, it's pristine. Even the next day, Danny, when when you stay there, I've hung out all day long there when you stay there and they start you know um as long as the weather's good everybody starts on one there's no two tee start sort of thing so you start on one so so d imagine the last group tees off at two o'clock they clear the front nine at quarter to five by six o'clock the maintenance crew starts working on the front it's an army they come down with the mowers. It is an army of guys. It is, it is, it is an unbelievable 
what they do and how they do it. And there's a different level of respect by the patrons. No question about it. Now, does it get a little over the top sometimes? You can't run. If you lay down, like I've I had some not real hardy guys dragging their themselves around all day and we go to the par three and there's cool little mounds around the green and stuff. And you know, they might lean back and as soon as it looks like you're laying down, right. a green jacket guy comes up to you and says, sorry, you can't lay down. Is that right? And if you don't, we're going to we'll take, take your out. ticket. Yeah. You're not allowed cell phones. No cell phones. No cell phones at all. You take your cell phone out. Even if it's not on, you take it out within a minute. D, D, this whole, in my opinion, the whole ground is surveilled. They've got cameras everywhere. And they're, they've, got, they've got to have a war room somewhere with somebody watching it's a little crazy. It's yeah. a little crazy. I kind of like the tradition, I, though. I like it. I like it, too. The par three is so cool. I A couple years back, we were sitting on the fourth with a group that I was hosting, and we saw in one group of threesomes, I think it was Spieth, Fowler, and Thomas were playing together, and JT makes a hole-in-one. Jordan hits it about two and a half feet, and Ricky Fowler hoops it right on top. Amazing. Two balls in the hole on the same hole, and the place just went crazy. And then, Danny, I was there when Jack Nicholas, either Jack or his grandson made a hole in one on the night. Anyway, you can look it up. I, I got my facts a little off, but it's, it's, it's special. It's just really special. And one of the most remarkable things, I don't know if you recall, hell, it's probably been 10 years now. Rory McIlroy was leading the Masters and he has never won the Masters. He's still looking for that for, to, for the career Grand Slam. And you get to number 10, and number 10 is a long, very downhill, sweeping dog leg to the left. So the way Roy drives it, you expect this huge drive out to the right, this big sweeper, and he'll hit it probably close to 400 yards if it's dry. He hit a drive that went, if it, it went, I'm not exaggerating, it went 50 yards left of where he was looking, and the total distance it traveled was... 72 yards. Sure. And I was like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> I, know, I mean, I, I, I just. I remember it. I mean, so, and then you get, you can go down. I could take you down to where the tree is, where Bubba Watson hit that massive hooking wedge. Is that the wedge best shot that's ever been hit there? I oh, mean, okay. outside of Tiger's chip, yep. which yep. have you I've ever seen, seen anything? The call by Vern Lundquist. Oh, it was so great. And this is Vern's last year this year. I was just going to say that. You know, which is, he is such a great guy in another tradition that um, unfortunately we'll, we'll not get to endure. Here's what's interesting about Bubba Watson's shot. Only a left-hander could pull that off. There's not a right-handed golfer that's ever lived that could slice a short iron that much. But if you get guys hooking, now he had to move his left to right, which is a fade for us right-handers. Bubba's left-handed. That's a big hook. He hooked a sand wedge 30 yards, 25, 30 yards. Just spectacular. How about the to get, I think this is great, but you can get into the, the details of this. If you want to become a member, it's not about how much money you, you can pay to be a member. You have to be asked to be a member. And if you ask, you're out. You're out. If you ask to get in, you'll never get in. If you ask how much it costs, you'll never get in. You just can't. This is like, well, it's the most exclusive club on the planet, bar, bar none. The um, Condoleezza Rice, who is, I think, just a really cool person. I've got to meet her once, but just a super cool person. She's part of that membership, and she's there that week, and she's just kind of hanging out, you know, and she's got her green jacket on, and it's – it's pretty cool. I um, How do they figure out who to ask? I don't know. Okay. Nobody does. <laughs> I mean, nobody does. No one talks about it. If you're one of the guys on the committee, or and, and I bet you the committee's probably two or three people, and if you bring that up, out, you're just not allowed to. to uh, let me tell you a fun story. So a friend of mine, Barry Baker, was running USA Networks. Barry is an extremely wealthy guy. He he uh, owned and ran radio stations for years and then started buying TV stations. He was running USA Network for Barry Diller when Barry Diller owned. And if you'll recall, USA used to um, 
uh, carry Thursday and Friday at Augusta, and their contract was expired. And Hootie Johnson sent an invitation to Barry that said, if you're interested in continuing, I'd like to have a meeting with you this Friday, 10 o'clock at Augusta National. Well, Barry's a character. Okay, Barry's a character. Never met a stranger. Very outgoing. Very marginally obnoxious, but really a good dude. He gets a private jet, flies down there, gets his clubs, got his clubs in the plane, and he, uh, Hootie says, I will have a driver meet you at the at the airport. Just let me have your details. So they give him the details. There's a driver sitting there in a little black sedan, and Barry says to him, should I bring my clubs? And the, the, the driver says, that won't be necessary. So Barry's like, hmm, okay. So gets in the car. There's no one there. This is the off time of year. So, so the private airport takes him 10 minutes to get to Augusta National, right? They pull him, take him in through the back way, move him around through the clubhouse, sit him in this office. There's no one in there. So Barry's just sitting there. Hootie Johnson walks in in about three minutes. Doesn't shake hands. Doesn't He says hello, but doesn't. And, and he sits down. How was your trip? It was fine. Great. Slides him a piece of paper and said, if you'd like to continue for the next five years to carry our tournament, here's what you'll pay. Barry looks at the piece of paper. He goes, okay. And Hootie stands up and walks out. Barry said he wasn't on the ground for 45 minutes. And that was it? That was it. What did he have to pay? He didn't tell me. <laughs> he wouldn't tell me. I wanted to know, too. But it's a lifetime membership. Yeah. No, no. This was for uh, for USA. I got you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This was for USA to carry the tournament for another five years on his network. I got you. Yeah, so it was. But I figured that he would get a membership potentially through his oh, connections no. through. Oh, Ud- no. Yeah. No, nope. okay. that doesn't, that's not how that works. Oh, I know that, yeah. but I just figured it, you know. Well, that's what he, might was, be- he was thinking he's going to at least get a round in. Right. Like, hey, who do you take me out and play and we'll negotiate this thing? And, not nope, a chance. It wasn't a negotiation. It's like, here's what it'll pay. And if you don't want it, we got a line of people. It's amazing. I know. It's amazing. I oh, love it. it it's, I know. It's, it's, it's kind of like what they did with the Martha Burke thing, Danny. Yep. So long ago where there was this big kerfuffle about your membership isn't right. We need to have more female members. And I'm not saying they're wrong. And, and Augusta said, you know, they, they said, we're going to protest and, and we're going to go to your sponsors. And you know what Augusta said? Fine. We, right. don't, we don't need sponsors. And so that year, there were no sponsors. And they gave Martha Burke and her team a platform for them to protest, you know, and here's where it is. And off they went. Sure. All right, there's uh, some young kids in St. Louis that would dream of playing mm. the Masters, and that's the UHY Prep Series, some of the top players on the boys' side for high school golf coming up. Jay has a visit with them. This is Golf with Jay Delsing. Hey, this is Jay Delsing for SSM Health Physical Therapy. Our golf program has the same screening techniques and technology as the pros on the PGA Tour use. SSM Health Physical Therapy has the Titleist Performance Institute trained physical therapists that can perform the TPI screening on you as well as use the KVEST 3D motion capture system. Proper posture, alignment, etc. can help you keep your game right down the middle. We have 80 locations in the St. Louis area. Call 800-518-1626 or visit them on the web at SSMPhysicalTherapy.com. Your therapy, our passion. For the best in Italian cuisine in St. Louis, look no further than Paul Mano's, located in Chesterfield. It's traditional Italian cooking, and their best ingredient, it's their tradition. It's cooking like Paul's grandmother used to make and like his mother still prepares today. There are no corners cut at Paul Mano's, from greeting you at the door to the pasta you'll share with your family. Paul Mano's is committed to bringing you their very best anytime you share a meal at their place. It's Paul Mano's located in Chesterfield. Redbird Heating and Cooling sponsors the Veterans Vocational Apprentice Program. Jed Dickinson, a retired Navy man, will teach mentor and sign off on educational and mechanical work hours to help you get fully licensed while you work and get paid by the company. What a great way to launch your career as a fully licensed HVAC specialist. Call Redbird Heating and Cooling today at 314-320-9507. That's Redbird Heating and Cooling. 
You're listening to Golf with Jay Delsing. To connect with Jay, log on to jdelsinggolf.com. You'll see the latest in equipment, find the latest innovations in golf, and get tips from a PGA professional. That's jdelsinggolf.com. Are you driving an out-of-warranty car? It's only a matter of time before your out-of-warranty vehicle is in the shop costing you thousands of dollars. Auto repair costs are up nearly 20% from last year, which is four times the rate of inflation. If an unexpected breakdown happened today, would you be ready for that? Well, now you can be with a plan through CarShield. Even if your car is just over three years old, it's still prone to expensive costs. Your car is more than just getting you from point A to point B. Traveling by car is a way of life. From picking up your kids to going to a new restaurant, cars are a daily essential. When you enroll in a car protection plan through CarShield, you can look forward to the following. The price will never go up no matter how many claims you file or no matter how high the mileage on your car increases. CarShield offers protection plans that start as low as $100 per month. That's $100 per month. They have repair coverage for up to 5,000 different parts of your vehicle. Plus, when your car breaks down and you're stuck on the side of the road, you get 24-7 coast-to-coast roadside assistance. You also get complimentary towing and rental car options. CarShield has my back when my car breaks down, and they can have yours too. Call CarShield today at 800 465 6550 or visit carshield.com. It's CarShield, proud sponsor of the Golf with Jay Delsing Show. This is Golf with Jay Delsing on a Sunday morning coming to you from the Car Shield Studios. As always, we're presented by Darty Business Solutions. We have added a really unique aspect to the show. We love it, highlighting some of the top prep players in the area. It's called the UHY Prep Series. We'll kick it over to Jay. Thanks, Danny. And I'm sitting down with Harrison Zipfel. He is a sophomore at uh, St. Louis University High School, my alma mater, and the number one junior golfer in the area. Harrison, thanks for jumping on with me. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right, so we just got five inches of snow like four days ago or a week ago or so, whatever it is. And But you guys are starting to prep for the high school season. Tell me a little bit about that. Preparation never stops for us, really. You know, we, we just stay on it as much as we can throughout the whole winter. You know, obviously – the snow was a definite setback for us, but we just kept trying to stay in the gym, stay in shape and getting out. We love to go to a place called family golf a lot. They've, and we just try and get as much quality practice as we can through the winter times. Oh, family golf and learning center. And Adam Betts is a good friend of the show, a good friend of mine. And I love, love, love what he's done uh, there. So, so you're hitting balls, you're in the gym, but you're you really can't play a whole lot right now, can you? No, no. We it's it's definitely a struggle that we have to face. Harrison, what kind of stuff? So you've won two AJGA events, um, which is man, a feat all to itself. You're playing against the best junior players in the country, and you're only a sophomore. What what sort of mental prep? do you do Harrison give people kind of a a look behind your curtain yeah the mental prep that we do quite simple you know we really just look at kind of who we want to be as a person and look at what we're grateful for and realize that those things are more important than the material things such as trophies although they are nice you know but they are just material things that are a result of all your hard work and all your training. So we really just focus on what we're grateful for and what we value in our life, such as God, our family, uh, our team, XGC, stuff like that. And that really helps us in those pressure moments. You know, we can focus on those things and that keeps us well centered and allows us to focus on our craft. Yeah, that's terrific. So it's really about processes, isn't it? Yes. 
And when you talk about processes, people are like, what? Wait a minute. I thought we were playing sports. But when you get in stressful situations, if you can just lock into the processes, meaning I'm going to commit to my shot, I'm going to go through my pre-shot routine, I'm going to not have any interference, I'm going to trust myself explicitly, that's the best you can do. Exactly. Got to have faith that your training has taken you far enough and you can rely on that. I know you got tryouts in a couple of weeks. Um, and then what do you know about the state tournament? Because I think more than anything, it's, it's, you, we all want to be playing well at the biggest times of the year. Yeah. You know, I really don't know much. Um, at this moment, I, I don't even know where it's going to be played. Um, I just know that, you know, we got to do everything we can throughout our entire high school season to get uh, myself and all my teammates ready for it. Fantastic. And then just last thing, Harrison, how does the team uh, look? You know, we look great. You know, I think like with every team, there's always rough patches that we need to clean up. But I think, you know, giving us a couple weeks of some real good training, I think we can smooth those patches and we'll be ready to go for the season. Man, I love your business approach. I love your, the matter of factness. I love the fact that you're talking about processes. Thanks for jumping on the show. Best of luck. And then maybe we can visit again kind of midsummer and get a, another check in with you. Yeah, it sounds great. Thank you. And now I have Nick Valella joining me. He is a sophomore down at St. Louis U High, a teammate of Harrison Ziffel's. Uh, Nick, thanks for joining me, man. Yeah, it's great to be on. All right, so we just got off the phone with Harrison, and we were talking with him a little bit. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing training-wise to try to get ready for uh, this spring golf season. It's just really important that we focus on uh, a little more strength and conditioning, I would say, because... We don't really get like the full short game time. We don't get the full amount of practice with the sun going down earlier. So I think a little bit more of our focus during the off season is uh, getting, you know, bigger, faster, stronger. On top of that, we usually do a lot more like uh, hitting like range sessions just because that's what's available to us over at family golf. They got the heated bays. So that's usually like our preparation for the high school season will be a little bit different from like the summer season just because like we have to work with our environment and uh, what we have at our disposal. I was just talking to Harrison, and he was talking about how much he enjoys Family Golf and Learning Center down there. Th- that's a really cool facility, isn't it? Yeah, it's great. I mean, it's heated. It's, like, partly indoor. It protects you from the wind. I mean, I was just out there, like, two days ago. It was, like, 20 degrees, and it was, like, <laughs> you know, I could wear a, just a long sleeve shirt, and you're fine. you got to be hardy, man, when you grow up here in St. Louis and you play spring golf. I really, really wish – that Missouri would let the, the boys play in the fall as well with the girls. It would make the courses better, the weather better. It's just such a better time of year. Yeah, I agree. I know some surrounding states do uh, do fall golf. Yeah, that would that would be a great change. So lastly, talk a little bit about the team. How's the team looking this year, Nick? I think we got a really good chance this year. We got, obviously, Harrison. We got a freshman, Parker, who's pretty good. Uh, there's a couple sophomores, um, good friends of mine that I've been seeing practice in the last couple of months pretty regularly. Two or three good seniors who are looking like they could shape up to be really good, um, especially in time for state. So I think we, I think we really got a good chance. Just work with them a little bit, practice. I think we can. I think we can get it. Oh man, I wish you all the best of luck. I really appreciate you jumping on the show, and let's plan on. Um on hoisting a uh, state championship trophy and jumping back on the show after you guys win. (laughs) Absolutely. Thank you. And I'm sitting down right now with Bubba Chapman. Bubba, thanks so much for joining me here on the UHY Prep Profile Series. I appreciate you giving me this opportunity. It means a lot. Oh, gosh. It's it's my pleasure. So, look, we got – I know it's crazy living in St. Louis, and and I wish – the, the boys got to play in the fall, but you got spring golf and you got a spring season coming up. What kind of prep are you doing these days? Um, I've been working a ton this off season uh, over at Elevated Performance with a really good group of trainers there. Um, and then more recently, last couple of months, just getting out with the guys on the team and, you know, really looking to build a strong top five. I know we got a lot of talent over at Chaminade and, you know, trying to keep my game in shape, working out a lot. Um, honestly, my practice has been, I would say a little bit less than in the last couple of years, as far as as many, how how many golf balls I've hit. It's been a lot more um, preparing my body for a long competitive season. You know, I'm going to be playing uh, a competitive high school season followed by in the summer playing a full amateur schedule and then going right into my 
fall semester at Mizzou freshman year. So I got a lot of competitive golf and, you know, kind of consistently for a while. So I just need my body to be ready to be able to perform for that long. So just trying to prepare my, my body and my mind to go play good golf. Yeah, right on. Gosh, so Bubba, you're currently work, uh, ranked 370th in the AJGA rankings. You've had a tie six, a T14, and a T15 in three of your last five AG. GA events and you're the co-champion from last year's state event so you've been playing a lot of good golf i've played well i'd say the uh that first t6 was a little disappointing because I, I think i was t2 going into that final round but um yeah i've played i've been able to play some really good golf i felt like last summer was almost a little stressful just kind of not being committed to a college yet and having to kind of travel week in and week out and play in front of college coaches was is it's a great experience and junior golf is giving me so many opportunities and I've appreciated everything that AJGA and, and UHY has done for junior golf. It's, it's opened so many doors for me and the character development that comes with uh, being put on a stage like that is just huge. So I'm looking forward to this summer, being able to kind of diversify my schedule a little bit and do maybe one or two of those AJGAs because they are such great fields, but also do kind of more heavy amateur stuff and where I'm going to see a lot of the college players. And I feel like I'm, way more equipped to handle, you know, any tournament, any situation, uh, just because of how many times I've been through it, uh, playing AJGAs and, and our high school schedule as well with that state championship event in there. So, yeah, it's pretty amazing what you guys can play nowadays. And, and, uh, so let's talk just a little bit about that pressure, Bubba, because everybody wants to play well when they need to play well, when they want to play well, it's just not that easy and you can kind of get in your own way. And then a, a scholarship to get, to get to play down at Mizzou is really awesome. Yeah, that was, you know, that kind of happened pretty late. I didn't, you know, I didn't get that commitment until October. Or I think it might have been early November, which was a, a late commitment for, you know, boys golf. But um, there was a coaching change there. And the the new coach that I am super excited to play for, and he's a great guy. He, he came from New Mexico where he was coaching for Yeah, Coach Glenn. Time. He's terrific. Coach, Coach I, Glenn. I think you're going to mm-hmm. love him. I, b- I believe I – I will fit in really well at that, at that team. And um, another thing I've been doing that when you talk about being able to play well under pressure, like something I've been doing this off season um, has been working with a sports psychologist. I work with Dr. Dirk Downing and um, it was something that my, my parents really encouraged me to do just because I think they noticed that it was, it was wearing on me that like having to compete, like you said, being able to go to an event and, and really, really want to play well. Uh, on a big on a big stage in front of in front of coaches and in front of really good players uh and then being able to play well for your team when it comes to state championships um it was a lot and it wasn't always easy and i made my fair share of mental mistakes through on on playing those events and i think um both both emotionally and golf course management so this off season for me working with a sports psychologist has kind of given me an opportunity to say, okay, like I have all the tools necessary to play great golf. I just got to get out of my own way. Uh, and how do I psychologically just kind of have this internal dialogue that's going to promote playing great golf, you know, in, in those moments. So that's something that I'm really excited to see how that translates to this competitive season. Um, and just couldn't be more excited to get it rolling here in a couple of weeks. Yeah. You're going to be working on a lot of process thinking, a lot of going through, you know, doing all you can do and then trying to let go. And it's so much easier said than done, but we are excited to watch it, Bubba. When do you guys get started? So we have our first practice on, on uh, Monday. Uh, we'll have tryouts. We had a lot of guys that are trying out this year. I mean, we had a meeting a couple days ago uh, where we had, we had like 50, 60 guys that are trying out for the team this year. So we'll have three teams and. Um, Obviously, Coach Wilson will he'll put the rosters together, and, and the rosters will fluctuate throughout the season. But our first kind of kind of big competitive event, we go down to Gulf Shores in like late March, right after spring break. Uh, we'll play a couple matches down there, and then right after that, we'll come back and play our first tournament, uh, like very late March. It's it's hosted by SLU. It's at the Bluffs. We played every year. Usually, the weather's terrible, so hoping for <laughs> a little better this year. But. Uh, and then we'll, yeah, we'll get the we'll get the ball rolling. You know, probably, eight, you know, once April hits, April through, you know, the state championship and kind of the middle of May is is a lot of competitive tournaments for us. So, well, Bubba, we wish you all the very best this year. Go ahead and, and knock off that. Uh, just eliminate the co-champion 
uh, on the on the uh, headline for the for the state championship this year and hoist the trophy, man. We wish you all the best of luck. Thank you so much, Jay. I appreciate it. That was the UHY Prep Series on Golf with Jay Delsing here on 101 ESPN. Much more to come. This is Golf with Jay Delsing. Darty Business Solutions has been enhancing the business of our customers for the last 37 years. How do we do it? Through our expertise in technology, better use of data and analytics, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. We roll up our sleeves and collaborate. We build applications and effectively communicate with our partner clients to bring their goals and objectives to the finish line. Our award-winning Access Point program is a community game changer. With nearly 100 students in the program, mostly young African-American females are making between $55,000 and $60,000 per year right out of high school. That's right, fifty-five dollars to $60,000 a year right after high school graduation. That's when they begin their training. CEO Ron Darty believes the talent is equally distributed, but access to that opportunity is not. So here's Access Point, providing more and more opportunity for those in and around our community. It's Darty Business Solutions. Get ready to watch the legends of golf up close when they compete at historic Norwood Hills Country Club right here in St. Louis. The Ascension Charity Classic will be back again with some of golf's biggest names. Steve Stricker, Padre Harrington, John Daly, David Duvall, Bernard Longer, Ernie Els, and more will return September 3rd through the 8th at Norwood Hills. All tournament proceeds go to area charities serving North St. Louis County youth and families. Sponsorship opportunities, pro-am foursomes, and more information available for you at ascensioncharityclassic.com. I'm delighted to welcome the Amateur Players Tour to the Golf with Jay Delsing show. The APT team has worked so hard to establish a national golf tour for amateurs. Folks, don't miss out on this opportunity. If you love golf and ever wondered what all the fuss about tournament golf is, then this tour is for you. We just released the 2024 schedule, and it is a beast. There's 21 events currently in the metropolitan St. Louis area with many more to come. But check out these golf courses. Paynes Valley, Ozark National, Stonewolf, Ambrier, Persimmon Woods, Gateway National, and a 36-hole event on Norwood's West Course, and many more. Okay, so the courses are certainly cool and nice, but what's really neat is the way the events are run and how they are run. The APT team does a fantastic job of closely monitoring handicaps and ensuring a good and fair competition. There are five divisions, a year-long points competition, major championships, elevated events, and much, much more. Right now, there are over 6,000 members in 41 different local chapters across the country. And all that's happened in just over five years. Join now and don't miss out on the best tournament golf in the country. Run for amateurs by amateurs themselves. Go to amateurplayerstour.com. That's amateurplayerstour.com. This is Adam Betts from Family Golf and Learning Center located in Kirkwood. Our motto is play your best golf. We have the best instruction for every skill level. Two female instructors along with our eight PGA instructors. We're there for the kids and the adults who are starting to play and trying to refine their game. Family Golf and Learning Center features a double-decker driving range, grass tees, and a short game area, along with indoor simulators and a performance center. That's not all. Don't forget about our back nine, Bar and Grill. Find out how we can help you and your family. Head to FamilyGolfOnline.com. That's FamilyGolfOnline.com. It's Family Golf and Learning Center, where we make St. Louis better at golf. Great segment that we have on Golf with Jay Delsing is the UHY Prep Series. That's Jay Delsing. I'm Dan McLaughlin coming to you from the Car Shield Studios presented by Darty Business Solutions. I, I would imagine that takes you back to your time in high school, and you love to talk to those kids about the upcoming season. Oh, it's exciting. Gosh, I mean, so, so much, some, some things just pop out. First of all, you know, I'm a slew grad. So I, I'm, I'm a little partial to Harrison and, and Nick down there, and I and I, I wish them well. But 
Bubba has got a, a good resume, got to go play for the University of Missouri. And it's interesting that all the boys are getting into these processes, D, and tr- taking this thing to the next level from a mental perspective and doing sports psychology. And that's a must. But, you know, Bubba talked about feeling pressure on himself, you know, playing in front of college coaches. And it, it, it's intimidating it's when you think about it. But, D, when we were kids, it was like, we didn't know any better. But you, you had know? to put up scores to yep. get noticed. Just, I think, I mean, we just weren't thinking. Well, you that's know, what, it, it, it just all I was doing was trying to, you know, bad ball, try to hit the thing. You should tell your story about how you wound up at UCLA, but you were very proactive in your recruitment. You I, know, I, I was. it wasn't like some coach showing up on your doorstep and saying, here you go, Jay, here's a ride to UCLA. I mean, you were very proactive in how you did this. I did. I, I bought a book. I'll never forget, Danny. It's probably five inches thick. And this was, you know, as my kids would say, you want me to spend my own money, Dad? Right. I was doing this with, with the money that I saved from Canyon. And I got a book on the, all the universities in the country. I sent a, a kind of like a Delsing resume if that is such a thing. I was on the cover of two of the Gateway Golfer magazines, an old magazine they had back then. And then I just sent like a resume with my my high school, my GPA, height, weight, you know, family stuff. Um, and um, I sent it to every single school south of Missouri. From I, I literally drew a line across the country and said, boom. And I sent out over 200 wow. of these things. I can remember the postage D was like a hundred dollars. This was sure. back in 19, you know, 1970. When I do it, 1978, you know, because I graduated in 1979, but man, Danny did it pay off. The best thing that happened to me was that I almost won the U S junior. So I lost in the semifinals, the quarterfinals, whatever to Don Herter, who eventually won the tournament. And I, I, he beat me in 21 holes. And so I had a real chance to to win that tournament. And that is that was the biggest tournament a young a youngster could play. And there was no AJGA. There was no, you know, I won a lot of the tournaments around here, but there, you know, there were 15 or 20 kids playing. Sure. It just wasn't a lot of golf. Um, and then I always managed to qualify for the the insurance youth classic and the PGA junior championship, which were the other two major national things. And then when I was a senior in high school, I qualified for the U S amateur and played in that before I got to college. So those were the things that set me to where I was. And so I had a lot of really cool offers. I had an offer from Yale, which my mom was convinced I was going to take. Not you're rolling your eyes. Not a chance. (laughs) She said, you're going to go to Yale. And I'm like, I'm not going to Yale. Well, you went to a pretty damn good school with the UCL. I'm like, are you UCLA, man? Yeah. Yale's up in Connecticut somewhere, cold and nah. No. We're going over to UCLA. It was oh, it it couldn't have been. Like I said, I've been so fortunate. Things worked out great for me. It couldn't have been better. You know, the thing I think about is that you were proactive, and for parents that are listening that have golfers that want to play in college, you have to be proactive. These coaches are not just going to show up at your doorstep. And yeah, are there elite? Boys and girls that might get noticed, yes. But generally speaking, you have to be proactive. 100%, Danny. In, in our UHY prep profile series that we do, we had Jerry Haas on last month, and he talked about that. And he said exactly what you're saying. When I talk to a young man, I want to know that he wants to come there. I don't want to talk to his parents. I don't want to talk to his swing coach. Jerry was much more interested. His scores are great. Yes, yeah, swing, okay, that's minor, but we'll look at that. I'm much more concerned about what kind of man he is. What's his character like? Is he someone that I want representing the great Wake Forest University, which is a perennial top 10 university? And your son Luke's going going to be a demon deacon down there. Yeah. Not for golf, but he's going because he wanted to go for the great business program that they have. And how difficult is that school to get in? It was yeah. it was quite a yep. ride for him. Yep, yep. pretty yep. cool. Luke's a talented guy, so we're going to send shout outs to Luke as well because I he's got a chance, man. Yep, he has he has a good week, and everybody could be playing for second uh, at the state uh, tournament uh, later this spring. So, yeah, it's just fun to watch these kids, and there's there's these uh, Harrison Diffel is the best. He's only a sophomore, Danny, but he's the he's in my opinion. 
pretty head and shoulders the best young player right now in, in our area and probably the best young player to come out of here in quite a while. Now, he's only 16. A lot of, a lot of life happens to you, but I, I'm really excited to watch what happens. Currently, he's ranked 41st in the AJGA rankings, and that's big stuff. He's won two national events already in the, in the AJGA series. Pretty amazing how good the talent has gotten golf-wise, even in what would be considered, quote-unquote, a cold-weather state in Missouri. You know, the, the cold comes for a few months, and then you're back out and playing. But, man, the talent has just skyrocketed since you were playing and what we see now. Oh, not even close. You're so right. I mean, I think about when we had Mike Small on, you know, the coach of the University of Illinois, and how he has made the University of Illinois must-see uh, it's a destination spot for golf. Absolutely. He's a perennial top five program every single year. And so Glenn down at Missouri is doing a great job. He's a, he's a, a new coach, came in for the University of Mexico. I expect great things out of him. It, it, it just shows you that you get the right sort of leadership and you get the commitment financially to, to, to go ahead and create some uh, facilities and you don't have to be. I mean, look at Oklahoma State forever. They've been a a, a great. Uh, I always think of Ricky Fowler. Yeah, yeah, Ricky Fowler. You've got more guys that come out of yep. Oklahoma State all the time, and they're down in Stillwater, Oklahoma. So we could toss out that that regional and that area thing. So you have helped a lot of high school kids, and we got to run to a break here momentarily. But your best advice to the parents of high school kids to get them to the next level or to improve their game enough to get to the next level? What would it be? Stay out of it. And and what I I mean by that is you're not a coach. Be, Be a parent. Make sure that your son or daughter is respectful and conducts themselves the way you want them to be conducting themselves. And look, this is tough because their brains aren't developed. And I can remember, Danny, I won the Missouri state junior when I was 16 and I made a 10 on like number five and my dad sees that he goes a 10 what happened I said well I hit my driver out of bounds left then I hit it out of bounds right then I hit a tree over the you know and he goes did you ever consider hitting something other than driver and I'm like (laughs) no never did never even in my mind so you're going to get a little of that crazy but be be fans of theirs keep them respectful and and help them when they're down but don't baby them part of what we talked about Adam Wayne right being on the show he talked about how much more he learned in his valleys and then his, his peaks and your life is like that way it's okay you're going to be disappointed get over it let's go tomorrow's a new day get your chin up work hard and see what you can do and Danny we say this all the time you never get to the top by aiming at the middle Go Shoot for it is high, what you're saying. Man. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I used to tell my girls, somebody is going to be playing on that on the US national volleyball team. Some little girl that grew up banging balls off the garage and outside and, and doing all the things. Why not you? Yep. Why not? I love that. And you have told kids, play aggressive. Go for it. Don't yep. don't sit back. Don't lag. Go for it. Absolutely. Listen, the only way to putt is to try to make every single putt and to putt to make, not to miss. And I don't care if you're 700 feet away. You need to try to make the putt because your miss is going to be closer than your lag. And you can talk, like, guys don't expect putts to go in, but they're trying to make every single putt because the closer, the, the, the more you focus on a small target, like the hole compared to a three-foot circle, don't ever, ever do that. Your miss is always going to be better when you focus on the hole and not that small circle. That's Jay Delsing. I'm Dan McLaughlin. We saw the return of Tiger Woods just a weekend ago. We'll break that down when we come back. Family Golf and Learning Center. No matter your age or skill level, Family Golf and Learning Center, located in Kirkwood, has something for you. They've got it all. PGA and LPGA instruction, double-decker driving range, par-3 golf course, trackman simulators, a large short-game green design to help you with all your shots around the green, bunkers, rough, and zoysia fairway pitching. 
And now open the Tahoma Bermuda Grass Tees, the best turf to hit from in St. Louis. It's all at Family Golf and Learning Center. To schedule a lesson or to find out more, visit FamilyGolfOnline.com. That's FamilyGolfOnline.com. Family Golf and Learning Center. We make St. Louis better at golf. So you've been hearing me talk about one of our community's greatest contributors and most philanthropically inclined companies. Yes, of course, I'm talking about Marcone. They're the largest distributor of General Electric appliance parts in North America. Did you know that Marcone is also the largest and most trusted supplier of commercial and residential appliance parts, HVAC, plumbing, commercial kitchens, and pools and spas? All of that's in North America as well. That's right, Marcone does all that. Marcone is committed to supporting our first responders, all the branches of service in our military, our police and firefighters, and many more. From the viewing deck at the Ascension Charity Classic, founded in honor of our military heroes, to their commitment to Reese Across America program, Marcone is here for you and your family, as well as your community. That's Marcone, the official sponsor of the Golf with Jay Delsing Show. Hey, St. Louis, Eddie McVeigh here from Maggie O'Brien's. When you head downtown for a concert or cards or blues game, and now for the St. Louis City soccer game, please come see us at Maggie O'Brien's before and after your event. Take our shuttle to and from or stay in-house and watch your favorite team on our multiple high-def TVs. We look forward to seeing you soon at one of our two locations in Sunset Hills on South Lindbergh or downtown at the corner of Market and 20th Street. Union Station is next to us. Powers Insurance and Risk Management is a family-owned local business that's been helping our community for over 200 years. In the always confusing world of insurance, Powers Insurance provides clarity, exceptional service, and the latest in cutting-edge products to deliver the highest quality in property and casualty coverage, as well as strategic planning consultation services. Powers Insurance and Risk Management will partner with you. That's right, they'll partner with you to customize the right coverage for you and your family. Tim Davis, Chief Operating Officer, will personally sit down and talk you through the ins and the outs of your policies. They are experts at helping you control your workplace expenses, helping to guarantee the safety that you and your employees need. You can visit them at powersinsurance.com. That's powersinsurance.com for all your insurance needs. For the best in Italian cuisine in St. Louis, look no further than Paul Mano's, located in Chesterfield. It's traditional Italian cooking, and their best ingredient, it's their tradition. It's cooking like Paul's grandmother used to make and like his mother still prepares today. There are no corners cut at Paul Mano's. From greeting you at the door to the pasta you'll share with your family, Paul Mano's is committed to bringing you their very best anytime you share a meal at their place. It's Paul Mano's located in Chesterfield. down the stretch on Golf with Jay Delsing presented by Doherty Business Solutions coming to you from the Car Shield Studios on 101 ESPN that's Jay Delsing I'm Dan McLaughlin final segment Jay and we're talking about Tiger Woods returned to the PGA Tour was at Riviera and had to take himself out of it now day one he had back spasms fighting through that day two quote unquote illness it did seem to be that way because illness was running through the tour at that time but just uh, your general impressions on what you saw just a weekend ago. I'm going to take the high road and just talk about the buzz that Tiger generated. Being there, releasing his new brand with TaylorMade and uh, Sunday Red, the new logo. The golf world was upside down, D. For, and, and so Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, he's playing in the Pro-Am, played with Josh Allen out there, played with some other celebs. And it's just it's just almost like a throwback, you know, back in the day when you'd have Jack Nicholas out there playing with Glenn Campbell and, and, and Dean Martin and all these, these cool celebs. And uh, watching him play, let's just talk about the way that he played on Thursday. Uh, obviously, extremely rusty is the first thing. But I got to tell you, I thought he was walking fine. I thought he was swinging okay. I wouldn't say great. I think he can. He, he will be wind up being more aggressive. But you got to remember, he's not playing enough, 
And that weather, Danny, you know what it's like. You've been to the West Coast 7,000 times. When it's 55 degrees or 60 degrees out there in limited amount of sun, it's cold. It's not, oh, it's it's cold. And the beach, Riviera, is less than a mile as the crow flies from the water. So you get that cool breeze in there. I, I thought Tiger looked okay. I thought he drove the ball really well. I thought he made a lot of putts. He also missed a lot of putts. What I was shocked at how bad his pitching was. He is a world-class pitcher of the golf ball, and he had terrible pitches on number two. It was a lousy pitch. It was a, he had a lousy bunker shot on three. He was 0 for 4 in getting up and down out of the sand traps and bunkers. And the guy, you know, he holes one out of four, mostly. So, rusty. Okay, what what happened on Friday definitely was sick. He was definitely sick. I talked to one friend out there, and they said he was pale. He w- he looked like he almost had the chills, and so that makes that makes sense. And then when you kind of parlay that D with what happened with Jordan Spieth, so here's what happened with Jordan Spieth. He shoots sixty five the first day, shoots two under the second day with a horrible finish. He double bogeys eighteen, but Danny he has got flu-like symptoms as well, and went from a double bogey on 18, signed his card, to a, needed an immediate bathroom break. Now, here's what could have happened, and I know he doesn't know this, but I know he knows now. If he would have said to the tour official, so the deal is this, D, you're not allowed to leave that scoring tent um, unless your card is finalized. So you leave, you're done. If, he, if there was that kind of emergency... They would have granted him, said, nope, we don't want an accident down here. Go ahead and come back. Just run, do do what you need to do, and then come back. And that would have been granted him, I'm 99% certain. But the rule is, and he didn't say anything to anybody, so no official knew, he's got this internal thing going with the flu, signs his card, and then takes off sprinting up the hill to get to the restroom. And so that's how we wound up missing there's so many checklists, Danny. This is what it looks like when you get finished on tour. You walk in the scorer's tent behind a table. There's a table, just a plain old six-foot table. A, a computer, there's two computers sitting on there, one facing you, one facing the official. There's an official there, and you have a walking score and your caddy. Three chairs, one for each player. A player sits down, his caddy's behind him, and then his wa- your walking score comes by when it's your turn and recites exactly what he's got recorded from you on your hole, and you're checking him off. And then... What I do is I call the my call my scores off to the official and he checks them on his computer and my caddy is checking them also. There's no way to, there's no way this happens other than this. I, I think I think he was serious uh, bathroom emergency. I want to go back to Tiger? He's going to play yeah. once a month. At least that's the schedule. Yeah. Can he dial it in just once a month? I don't know. Yeah. I think it's going to take – I'm hoping, and you and I have said this off the air a thousand times, we might as well say it on the air, we're hoping he, he, he picks, a, picks up a couple events here and there. I, it just depends on how his recovery is. You know, this week's going to get thrown out because he did all this prep, then he, gets, he plays a, nine holes in a pro-am, then he plays on Thursday and plays, what, six holes on Friday, and now he's out. And now he's going to be weak. You know what that flu is like. It's terrible. So – He's going to, the, the tour's moving back to Florida. His next event's probably going to be Arnold Palmer, I'm guessing, right? In Orlando. In Orlando. And yep. so hopefully the weather will be warm and, 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 and hopefully he's going to play in the, in the, um, the P, the players championship as well. At, Which would be great. Uh, at, at the, at, um, at Ponte Vedra in Jacksonville. So we'll have to wait and see, but we know he will be in Augusta. We know that. So. Hopefully those those tournaments, even though they might be month by month, hopefully there's, you know, this week, one week off, then we get Tiger again. And I think as he starts seeing a little more success, Danny, and some of his game starts coming around to a better degree, he, he hopefully he wants to play. He, he, can, he can afford to play more from a physical standpoint. One minute left. We were talking about Liv. Are they making an impact? It was funny. You didn't hear one thing about Liv when Tiger was playing last weekend it was all about tiger it, it, it's 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 amazing i mean as roger Malpe said he is the needle he doesn't move it he is the needle and so yeah it's interesting to see and and uh i don't know man it's it's um there's some great great players out there but tiger's the man and and, and hopefully we get to see him more 
Hey, great show, UHY Prep Series. Also, our visit with Jim Tejans. His book, uh, he's the author of Saves. It's the title of his autobiography. And, Jay, thanks for doing this, as always, on a Sunday. We go 8 to 10 here on 101 ESPN. Love you, Danny. Love love the, uh, getting the check off. And uh, hit him straight, St. Louis. Do you remember the golden rule? I'm sure you do, but just in case it goes like this. Treat people the way that you'd like to be treated. At People's National Bank, that one statement is the cornerstone of what this bank is all about. Locally owned with 23 locations in Southern Illinois and the metropolitan St. Louis area, People's National Bank parlays a robust menu of commercial or personal banking services you could possibly need with a friendly yet hardworking Midwestern attitude. Maybe you just wanna do business with a bank whose entire team lives in the same neighborhoods as we do. If you're like me and doing business with someone you trust is important to you, then People's National Bank is the bank for you. Jason Rantham, local president, is here for you to call and he'll answer any questions you may have. His personal cell is 314-974-2243. You can also find us online at peoplesnationalbank.com. People's National Bank is here for all of your banking needs.